To a land where joys will never end I'll fly away I'll fly away, oh glory I'll fly away When I die, hallelujah, by and by That shows you how much we need our musicians. <laughs> okay. maybe.
be seated. Can't put it off any longer, can I? I appreciate that. It's like preaching to the family. Although I'm not preaching, it's just... We had fun last night. We were at the Gatesville prison, and uh, it was a blessing. It was a blessing. You're not getting reruns. This is a new message. It's not the same one I did then. Uh, I wanted to start out by, Lord, where are you? Sometimes I think during the course of the day, during the course of the month, the week, the years, we go in and out of, Lord, where are you? I feel like I'm on my own. I'm, I'm struggling here, and I just don't, don't know where you are. And of course, Psalm 22 was a psalm of David. It was a prophetic verse that he had said about the crucifixion, about what Jesus had said. Of course, Matthew 27, 46 was actually what Jesus had said to the Father. My God, my God, why has he forsaken me? And if you don't know, forsaken means deserted me. And so, far from my help are the words of my groaning. So, I'm not going there in the Bible, but this is just something that they said that struck a chord with me. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to go to Psalm 139. My favorite psalm, of all the Psalms, I think the guys at the Bible study in the morning, they know about my favorite Psalm. Uh, the guys at the jail know it's my favorite Psalm. The guys, the ladies at the prison know it's my favorite Psalm, so I better do a pretty good job, but we'll see. So, David writes... And obviously guided by the Holy Spirit, he says, it starts in verse 1, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down, you know when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. Starting out, David lays down a, a very personal doctrine. And actually, while I was doing the study, it reminded me of Jesus' model prayer. During the course of, as we read, and actually, maybe I should read 1 through 18. I'm going to stop at 18 if I have time to get through it all. I'm going to read through it. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar, you scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. I love that. And the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. 
For you formed my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Pretty cool psalm, and, and I'm, I'm not even done yet. But then it starts getting a little hatred towards the wicked and this and that. But I want to focus on the first 18 verses. And what I notice about those first 18, it sounds like the beginning of the model that Jesus gave us how to pray, the disciples. It was... Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And in those 18 verses is like a praise and giving glory to God the Father. As we should always open our prayers realizing who we're talking to. And it's like, what is prayer but a conversation with God? And I think we make the mistake so often in our prayers of talking too much. Because in a conversation, and this is a relationship with God, correct? I mean, we're in a relationship. This ain't religion. And in a relationship, both parties need to communicate to one another. And who's got the most to offer in, in our relationship with the Lord? Surely not me. It's like, I need to sit and just be quiet. It's like that verse, be still. And know that I'm God. Another thing that David does, he he as we read this, this is if we have written it because he says, Search me and know me. And this is something that he personalizes it. He just doesn't say, search us and know us. But he says, search me and know me. And I've often thought when I read this that in those times that I may not be walking with the Lord or as as much or as close as I should be, this is a very uncomfortable psalm because it's, it's an intimate psalm. It's a psalm that says how close the Lord is to me, whether I want it or not. But when I'm walking with him, it's like, man, there's nothing better. It's, you know, this psalm refutes that what people so many times take out of context, where two or more are gathered, there I am in your name. Well, no, you're by yourself, he is there. It's not, you don't have to have another person, another believer there. That was taken out of context for another study. And so I think that that's really great that David just says, Lord, me, you search me, you know me, You've, you're dealing with me and nobody else. The great thing about this is that we can all put, our, put ourselves in David's place because the, and the great thing about God is that he looks at each one of us as if we're his only child. He, he doesn't grab hold of us as a whole. He grabs hold of each one of us because he can all at the same time. He is... He is that's, that displays his omnipresence. And obviously, as we read through 1 through 18, 
it, it tells us a bit of his omniscience, his all power. All, he can be everywhere at once at the same time. What I found in the study was also, it says, let's see, sit down, understand, pardon me. You have searched me and known me. And, and the funny thing, when I, when I was doing the study, Proverbs 25.3 says, As the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so are the heart of kings is unsearchable. The heart of kings are unsearchable, the Bible says. And yet for God, nothing is unsearchable to him. And David, I don't believe David at the time was king, but even kings, God doesn't care about titles. He doesn't care, he doesn't care about Mr. or Mrs. or isn't where is it uh, Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, all are one in Christ Jesus? That's what that's what it is. That's what he says. Also he, he seems to enter the, into this psalm as described in Psalm 111.10 and Proverbs 1.7, which are very similar, but they're very different too. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. He enters into this prayer to the Lord, realizing who he's talking to. It's not a fear, scared fear, it's a fear realizing with awe and reverence to the Father. And it's just, it's, it's great. It's, it, it, and it really didn't, I didn't really think about that angle, you might say, until I did this study. And it says, uh, Verse 2 and 3, it says, You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you understand my thought from afar, you scrutinize my path and my lying down. He knows all of our actions. Doesn't matter. He knows it all. He knows our comings and goings, how they're done according to our mood, according to how, if we felt like do what we're doing, if we're all into it, or if we're just doing it halfway. He knows all of that. There's nothing, whether we're angry, whether we're joyful, whether we're exhausted, whether we're bored, he knows it. He understands it. He, he understands it. He may not like some of it, but he knows it. We can't just casually go through life thinking that, eh, nobody gets it, you know, at most, maybe our wife can read, read us just by our expression or how we said something, whether we said it quickly and abruptly. Then sometimes, you know, our wives can say, well, eh, he's in a mood. Or, you know, or, and, it, and it's like, I, I better give him some distance, you know, give him some space until they kind of decompress from work or whatever. But it's like... God knows all of that. All means all to him. When, when we say he knows all my actions, all my comings and goings, all, all, there's nothing left unexposed to him. Scrutinize, the word scrutinize, you know, we, a lot of words we use that we don't, we know what it means, but it's like, uh, you know, tell me what it means, you know. He examines me closely and minutely. It's, a, it's an examination that's even more thorough than under a magnifying glass or, or a microscope, you might say. Because we're talking God Almighty. 
in my research, I like to go through the commentaries, Matthew Henry, and he makes a note that says, you know, you know all my imaginations. Nothing is more close and quick than thought. It is always unknown to others. We can put on a facade to others and they say, oh, you know, they're such a wonderful couple or he's such a nice guy, but it's just a, a mask. It is often, Matthew Henry writes, it is often unobserved by ourselves and yet you understand my thoughts afar off, the Bible says, Though my thoughts be ever so foreign and distant from one another, you understand the chain of them and can make out their connection. When so many of them slip by, slip my notice that I myself cannot. So many thoughts go through my head, and yet he knows my thoughts from afar. He says, you understand them afar off, even think before I even before I think of them, and long after I have thought of them and have myself forgotten them, which as time goes by, there's a lot that I forget. Or you understand them from afar, from the height of heaven you see into the depths of the heart, both good and evil. We say, well, you know, that's, God is really into the minutia of it all. But then Jesus explains in Matthew 10, 29 to 31, are two sparrows not sold for an, for an, an Assyrian, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are counted, all counted. So do not fear, you are more valuable than a great number of sparrows. He didn't sacrifice his son for sparrows. He sacrificed his son for us. The clock is moving too quickly for me. Verse 4 states... You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. There isn't a word in my tongue, not a vain word nor a good word, but you know it all together. You know what it meant and from that, what thought it came from and, what, and with what design it was uttered. There is not a word at the tip of my tongue ready to be spoken yet kept in, but you know it. One thing that he said is thoughts are words to God. I'd never heard that before, and it was like, to me, that was just so profound that even my thoughts are like I've spoken them. Because doesn't, didn't Jesus say, I tell you, it is written, thou shalt not commit adultery. And he also said, it is written, thou shalt not commit murder. But if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, the thought, it's as if you did the deed. If you call a man, a, a person, a fool in your heart, it's as if you murdered him, his character. Our thoughts are words to God. Verse 5 states, oh, I said verse 4 as verse 5. You have enclosed me before, behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Wherever we are, we are under the eye and hand of God. Wherever we are, God knows us. We know not only what we see, but what we feel and have our hands upon. All his saints are in his hand. In the Lord's hand, God's put them in. The Father has put them in the Son's hand. And can anybody take from the son's hand, nobody that the, that the father has given him.
what, what kills me is David here is like, he's going, this is mind-blowing. I mean, if he was in the 60s, he said, that, this is a mind-blower. He says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I can't grasp it. He speaks of it with admiration. He says, it's too wonderful for me. It's high. Thou hast such a knowledge of me as I have not of myself. We think we know ourselves. We don't have a clue compared to how God really knows us. I can't take not notice of all my own thoughts or make such a judgment of myself as thou makest of me, he says. In a, in a prayer, is it what we would say to him? It is a no, such a knowledge as I cannot comprehend, much less describe that you know all things I am sure, but how I can't tell. We can't by searching or even Googling to find out how God searches. You know, that'd be the one time Google would just be, be blank. Nothing. Nor, it says, and, and we can't by searching or even Googling find out how God searches and finds out us, nor do we know how we are known. Now this is a verse that I'm going to say that David and I, we look at each other, we've quoted it together. 1 Corinthians thirteen twelve. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part... We all just know in part. We're looking through a foggy mirror. We can barely make out our own image. But then, then, we all know the then, then when we're with him, I will know fully just as I also have been fully known. That's pretty cool. That is very, we will know as God knows me. We have, I mean, that's just one of a trillion things that we're going to be so thankful for or blown away by. Verse 7, 7 through 10, he's, he's, David writes, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in, in hell or Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me. Even your right hand will lay hold of me. He's just making a statement. He's not testing God to see if he can run away from him so he can do whatever he wants to do. But he's just making, we can't go anywhere to the remotest island in the middle of the ocean that would take a, a navy months to find. God says, I'm already there. I was waiting for you. I knew you were going to show up. It's like he's saying, suppose I try to flee from you, Lord, and I give you all these scenarios, but you're already there. My God, my God, where has thou forsaken me? Has he forsaken us? Never. Never. Jeremiah 23, 24 says, Can a person hide himself in hiding places so that I do not see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord? He fills the earth. He fills the universe. If I ascend into heaven, to the third heaven, he's there. If I, if I descend into hell, he's there. I can't escape him. Why would I want to escape him? Do 
God is spirit, and for us to sometimes think that just because we can't see him, he can't see us, sometimes I think we get caught up in that, and it's most of that time is especially when we're not walking with him, or when we fall into the ditch before we get out of the ditch again. And it's like, it, it reminds me of the, you know, little kids, I've got two little I say little grandbabies, they're six, but when they were tiny, and even my daughters, when they were so little, and we played hide-and-seek, well, they felt they were hiding if they just did this. You know, if they can't see me, then they're hiding. And it's the great, I mean, it's, man, that's a great hiding place. You know, and you pretend like, where are you? You know, but yet they're standing right there, giggling. You know, and it's like, I love it. I love that. And in our own adult way, sometimes we do that. We forget. We forget Psalm 139. And we do what we do. He said, um, Matthew Henry, there's, there's, Oh, man, there's this parrot. Maybe I shouldn't read it. That's okay. Because maybe this will be a two-part sermon after Albert gets back. So we know we can't escape him. Why would we want to? Verse 11, 11 and 12, If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night, Even the darkness is not dark to you. And the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. It's it's such a joke. I know before I became a Christian, I frequented the bars, and the bars were all low lights. Like, you know, nobody's going to see me. Besides, everybody, I looked pretty good at night when the light was low. And, you know, everybody looked good really good, you know, and you wanted to get out of there before last call because they turned the lights back on and it's like, holy cow, I've been talking to you, you know, or you've been talking to me. It's like, who knows what they were thinking, but it's just, we, we kid ourselves. We think that we're pulling something over on, on everybody except for the most important person in our life. I've written here, no veil can hide us from God's eye. No, not even the thickest darkness. We can be in the depths of a cave. I've been in caves where you just cannot see anything. But God's standing there, I'm sure, just going, what are you, you going to do now? You're going to run into the side of the cave. You know, you're, you're just going to be, you know, you're being foolish. What are you doing? It's all the same to him. Secret places of sin are as open before God as the most open and bare-faced immorality. The darkness darkeneth not from thee, for there is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. We have to think about that. Verse 13. This, I, I love this next section. Not that I didn't love the previous, but this is just, to me, this touches on 40 days for life. Verse 13, For you formed my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. You know, I tell people at the jail, the guys at the jail, because they're really big on touting how many kids they have with how many women 
and this and that. And it's like, really, seriously, you're, you're proud of that? And then I think of all the innocent ones, the babies, the babies that never saw the light of day, that from... Psalm 139 tells me from conception, from when the egg, when the sperm went into the egg and it was fertilized, that was life. And God was started doing his work. You formed my inward parts. Your hands fashioned, your hands made me, fashioned me, gave me understanding so that I may learn your commandments. All that was from the very beginning. Isaiah 44, 24, this is what the Lord says, He who is your Redeemer and the one who formed you from the womb. Job 10, 11, Clothe me with skin and flesh and intertwine me with bones and tendons. The Lord's putting us together in the womb from the very beginning. He's already known us before the foundation of the world. He knew us. He knows our name. He knows how many days are ordained for us. It's already set. It's set. At the point of conception, it's set. Verse 14 says, where am I? If I, I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. <laughs> I wrote on here, it says, whether we like it or not, what we see in the mirror, whether we like what we see or not, whether we say, Lord, look at the size of my nose. What were you thinking? You know, but it says, wonderful are his works. He makes no mistakes. And he looks at each one of us like, wow, you're beautiful. Verses 15 and 16. I'm about to get the hook here in a minute. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me when yet there was none of them. Ecclesiastes 11.5 says, Just as you do not know the path of the wind and how bones are formed in the womb of the pregnant woman, so you do not know the activity of God who makes everything. Psalm 56.8, You have taken account of my miseries, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? I mean, he, he stores every one of our tears that we've shed. Job, Job 14.5, Since his days are determined, the number of his months is with you, and you have set his limits so that he cannot pass. If I'm not ready... If God is not ready for me, I could get run over by a bus and somehow survive. You know? It's just the way it is. Verse 17 and 18, which is right at the end. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I could count them... They would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Psalm 
Psalm 45, many Lord, many Lord my God are the wonders which you have done in your thoughts towards us. There is no one who, to compare with you. If I would declare and speak of them, they would be too numerous to count. Psalm 92, 5, how great are your works, Lord. Your thoughts are very deep. Psalm 3, 5, I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I did a little... <laughs> I googled to ask Mr. Google, whoever it is, gives the information... How many grains of sand are there on the earth? Crazy question, but I, I didn't expect to get an answer, but I got an answer. It says, assuming an average size, average size of what? Of, of, of a grain of sand, calculating how many grains are in a teaspoon, then multiply by all the beaches and deserts in the world. Earth has very, very roughly... 7.5 times 10 to the 18th power of grains of sand, or 7 quintillion 500 quadrillion grains. And yet, the Bible says his thoughts outnumber those, the sand. I mean, it's like, how much can he be thinking about each one of us and not get bored out of his mind. But he is so intimately involved with us that we need to stop and think about that every so often. We need to be still. So, really, that was left for David and for Jesus. But it's not for us. Because he's with us. We're going to have communion now. And my cue was the kids coming in. And so... I guess we'll, everybody who knows will be coming through the center section and uh, the four people that are to hand out the juice and the bread. If you can come up, please. So while they're putting on the gloves, I, I, my hope is that we don't come before the Lord in prayer or during the course of our day that we really think about who God is and that he's always with us. Whether we like it or not, and I hope and pray that we all love it. So you can go ahead and start. Both sides coming in.